Hi, this is Mac from Max List. Before we start the show, I want to let you know about my new book, Land Your Dream Job Anywhere. I've been helping job seekers find meaningful, well-paying work since 2001. And now I put all my best advice into one easy-to-use guide. My book shows you how to make your resume stand out in a stack of applications, where you can find the hidden jobs that never get posted, and what you need to do to ace your next job interview. Get the first chapter now for free. Visit maxlist.org slash anywhere. This is Find Your Dream Job, the podcast that helps you get hired, have the career you want, and make a difference in life. I'm Mac Pritchard, your host and publisher of MaxList. I'm joined by my co-hosts, Ben Forstag and Jessica Black from the MaxList team. This week, we're talking about how to prepare for your next job interview. It's always exciting to get asked to interview for a job. Now you need to get ready. Our guest expert this week is Jessica Smith. She says you need to do plenty of homework ahead of time. Jessica and I talk later in the show about what you need to do before you walk into the interview. If you use LinkedIn every day like we do at MaxList, you may have noticed the site just got a makeover. Our one new feature allows you to indicate that you're open to new opportunities. In a moment, Ben Forstag will tell us about the pros and cons of telling people you want to change jobs. How long should you wait after a job interview before following up with a hiring manager? That's our question of the week. It comes from Chris Mitchell in Portland, Oregon. Jessica Black offers her advice shortly. First, as always, let's check in with the MaxList team. Uh, We're here in the studio in downtown Portland. And our topic, Jessica and Ben, is how to prepare for a job interview. Now, we've done a number of shows uh, about job interviewings, but our focus today is that what to do when you hang up the phone after, or open the email, rather, uh, after (laughs) getting that invitation, because who calls anybody anymore uh, for for a job interview? And what kind of research have you two done uh, before you've walked into an interview and when you in your own job searches, when you've been preparing for interviews? Yeah, it's an interesting topic and a uh, really important one. Also, I always, I'm a researcher. I like to, I like to sort of check in about the company culture. I do a lot of Google searching and looking on the website specifically. I look at what they, how they talk about themselves, sort of the the verbiage they use, um, which also just helps get an idea about what specifically their mission is and what their focus is, sort of at the maybe at the moment, or if there's various programs that they're championing at the moment, uh, and just kind of doing some news searches. You know, you can if you just do a Google search, you'll see recent recent articles or um, or things that they have posted lately to kind of get an idea of what's happening in their world um, currently. So it's kind of a good way to be be in the know so that you're prepared for the interview. Good. Yeah, and I, a lot of people do that. And employers obviously are Google searching us when we're candidates for jobs too, for mm-hmm. a job too. Right? Mm-hmm. What about you, Ben? So, uh, like Jessica, I like to do a lot of research. For me, I've, I've tried to focus on uh, how does the organization make its money? Because I think if you can figure that out, you can usually position yourself pretty well as a, a solution maker for that organization. Uh, in my background in the nonprofit world, that meant always trying to find the 990 forms for nonprofits, and you can find those on uh, Charity Navigator or GuideStar. The 990 is just the IRS filing that the nonprofit has to make. It's a public record, um, and it gives you a breakdown of uh, where the organization's getting its money, whether it's through donations or earned income or other areas. Um, so I would spend some time getting to research that. And I, I think, doesn't the 990 tell you who the highest paid uh, member of the staff is? It has to tell you certain staff folks. Like I think the executive director is almost always there. Um, and then if there's anyone else making over a certain threshold, yeah. um, there, there are certain rules about who needs to have their income disclosed and who doesn't. 
Yeah, I do recall pulling those files too, and it, it was always fascinating. To, it gave you a sense of what the salary ranges were like at those organizations. Yeah, it just gives you a sense of how viable the organization is financially. Uh, you can see their budget, how much money they're bringing in, how much money they're spending. Um, and I thought that was a real valuable thing to know before you even go into that interview to get a sense of uh, – you know, what the organization's like, what your expectations are going to be as an employee there. And also, I think that tells you a lot about the culture as well. Yeah, agreed. Well, you two were much better prepared than I was in my <laughs> 20s because I, I'm embarrassed to say, would actually wing it and walk into interviews not knowing all that much about the organization or uh, and usually almost nothing about the people I was meeting I with. think we've all had that experience at one point or another. Yeah, That's um, how you learn. Yeah, you do. And it can be a painful lesson as you suffer through those interviews. Yeah. And to be fair, it was a different time as well. I mean, the Internet has made research a whole lot easier than it was 30 or 40 years ago. Yeah. But uh, we'll hear from Jessica just how, how much uh, you can do before you get into an interview uh, and learn about the company and, and the people you're going to meet. But also how that can help you stand out as a candidate and ultimately get a, help you get a job offer. Now, before we talk to Jessica, let's turn to you, Ben, because every week you're out there exploring the Internet on behalf of our listeners, looking for those websites, books, tools, and other resources people can use in their job search and career. So what have you uncovered for listeners this week, Ben? So this week I'm going to talk about a new feature I found on LinkedIn, which solves one of these ongoing problems I hear from job seekers, which is when people are looking for work, some people believe you should always put in your LinkedIn status, open to new opportunities. And other people say, never do that. And it's just like, I'm not sure there's a right answer there, right? But it ends up there's this new feature on LinkedIn that allows you to essentially wave a little flag for recruiters and employers saying, I'm available for new opportunities without actually saying it in your headline. And can anybody see this uh, declaration of interest in changing jobs or is it only visible to employers and recruiters. It is only visible to recruiters. That's the cool thing about okay. this. So can your boss find out? Well, I was going to ask you at the end of my segment, <laughs> Mac, if you've noticed anything different about my profile. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I turned it on just to see what happened. Um, and if you haven't noticed anything different, and I, I know you're a lurker on LinkedIn, okay. <laughs> uh, then it must work. But I want to give a hat tip to uh, two folks who are on one of our recent webinars, Larry Guerrera and Tenley Proudfoot. Uh, they actually turned me on to this resource. I did not know about it until they mentioned it. So if you go to the jobs tab on LinkedIn and then under preferences, there's a little button at the bottom of the page uh, called open candidates. And you just literally flip a switch. And all it does is it, uh, it sends out a little secret beacon to recruiters saying this person is available to be recruited for opportunities. Now, I don't know how effective this is as a job search tool, and it's certainly a very passive job search tool, but it is an interesting option that people should think about when they're putting together those LinkedIn profiles. Do you, do you know if there is a search feature that the recruiters are using for that? Is that the way that they're finding them? Yeah. I mean, uh, recruiters have their own special version of LinkedIn where they pay for uh, like a subscription to it. And this is one of the features they get when for the, they pay for that subscription. Hmm. Now, again, I think this is a pretty passive approach to job search, and I wouldn't make this the be all end all of your search. And I believe one of our past guests recently even said, like, recruiters, they're looking for skills. They're not looking for your availability. And if you've got the right skills, they're going to recruit you whether you're actively looking for a job or not. Um, but again, this is another one of these little tools that exists that you should probably turn on if you are looking for new opportunities because it can't hurt. Great. Well, and, and I know that LinkedIn launched a new uh, makeover of its site in January and they've been rolling it out. I just got the new version uh, – about a week ago. I don't know if you two have seen it. I've I, had it for about a month now. Have you? I have, yes. I've had also for about a month. And um, I did notice, Mac, that I had it before you had it, which was very, I thought that was curious. Yeah, it could be alphabetical order. I don't know. but Who knows? I'd be curious to know. But I'm, I'm sure we'll uncover more new features like this as we get to know the new uh uh, the new version of the site. And if listeners have uncovered other hacks like uh, the one that our webinar listeners shared with us, uh, please share them with us. Yeah. Great. And so I will actually have a link to uh, a LinkedIn blog that talks about this feature and the link will be in the show notes. Okay. Well, thank you, Ben. Now, if you've got a suggestion for Ben, please write him. He'd love to hear from you. His address is ben at maxlist.org. 
We'd love to feature your idea on the show. Uh, now let's turn to you, our listeners. Jessica Black is here to answer one of your questions. What's in the mail? What's in the Max List mailbag this week? That's becoming a tongue twister. <laughs> it is it? a little bit. There's yeah. a lot of M's in there. Yeah. Uh, we have a question this week from Chris Mitchell here in Portland, Oregon, and he is going to ask um, some things related to interviewing also. So let's listen to what his question is. Hi, my name is Chris from Portland here, and I interviewed for a job recently, thought that it went really, really well, but I haven't heard back. It's been about two weeks and I'm wondering what your thoughts on following up are. Should I have done that already? Or at this point, should I just move on? How long is appropriate to, to wait to do that? Thanks. All right, Chris, that's, an, that's a great question. It's, uh, your question is about when do you interview or when do you follow up after your interview? And that's such a tricky, tricky question because... A lot of times employers are just really busy and they get bogged down with all of the things related to, you know, usually when someone is searching for a candidate, uh, there's a lot of other things happening in the office as well. They're usually down a person and so they're picking up slack as well. And so uh, I think a lot of times emails just don't get the follow up just doesn't happen as quickly or efficiently as they would like or you would like. So I think that there is a really, um, there's no harm in just sending a nice, f just check-in email of, hey, <laughs> following up on our interview, um, likely after your interview, you sent a, a follow-up as well. That's a, that's a good etiquette to follow of either an email, uh, definitely a, a handwritten note is always great, especially if that was an in-person interview, but just, um, checking in on if you've made any decisions, uh, I'd, I'm still very interested in the job. I would love to, to connect with you, um, and leaving it very, um, letting them know you're still interested, uh, but very mellow tone that you're not, you're not being pushy. You're just, you know, checking in to see if they have any information or if you can answer any questions. Um, maybe don't offer that, but just kind of let them know that you're still around. What do you guys think? So I, I think first, hopefully you, you did send that follow-up email and uh, note immediately after the interview. That would be the first round of follow-up. I would say it's completely fine to follow up with them as well if it's been two weeks. But ideally, in the interview, you asked, what is your timetable about next steps? Uh, when can I expect to hear back from you on, with your decision either way? Um, and that should give you some time frame to think about, you know, um, you know, when an appropriate time to follow up is. They might say like, oh, you know, I'm actually going on vacation for three weeks. So that tells you don't expect an answer in three weeks. Uh, but if they said, we're going to get back to you next week and next week has come and gone, yeah, write them an email. Yeah, that's a really good note. Yeah, I, I agree. And it, it is frustrating, Jessica, to your point, because when you're the candidate, this is often one of the most important things on your plate. Uh, and if you're the hiring manager, you're probably juggling a lot of things. It's it's not that it's not important. It's just one of many priorities that you're, you're facing. Right. Yeah. So I, I think having some patience and Yes, don't leave the room, ideally, in an interview without asking uh, when, what the next step is and what the date is and how best to follow up. And if you, whether or not you ask that question, I, I'm a big believer. I think listeners know in the rule of three, you'd always three attempts. So um, send that first thank you note. Uh, if you don't hear anything, say within a week or two weeks' time, send a second note. And then maybe two weeks after that, a third. Uh, and then just in that final communication, say, I don't want to be a pest. I, I remain very interested. I'll wait to hear from you. Mm -hmm. And most people respond after the second note. Yeah, that's a good note. And I, I mean, I speak from a bit of experience, not personally, but knowing um, several friends who have gone through that process as well, where they just were heartbroken because they didn't hear anything back after feeling really great about the interview. And it really was just because the employers were over overrun and they just didn't have the time to, to follow up. And, um, my friend uh, had a lot of pride and didn't want to, to follow up with them because they were like, no, that obviously just means that I am, they didn't want me or whatever. So it, again, to your point, when you're the candidate, uh, it's the most important thing to you and all your mind kind of just goes crazy. So be patient, 
uh, do a little follow up after if you don't hear anything um, and likely you will hear something. Great. Well, thank you, Jessica. Excellent advice. And if you have a question for Jessica, please email her. Her address is easy to remember, jessica at maxlist.org. Or call our listener line. That number is area code 716 job talk at 716-562-8255. If we use your question on the show, uh, we'll send you a copy of our new book, Land Your Dream Job Anywhere. And we'll be dropping one in the mail to Chris um, this week. So thank you, Chris, uh, for that question. We'll be back in a moment. And when we return, I'll talk with this week's guest expert, Jessica Smith, about what you need to do to prepare for your next job interview. Most people struggle with job hunting. The reason is simple. Most of us learn the nuts and bolts of looking for work by trial and error. That's why I produce this podcast, to help you master the skills you need to find a great job. It's also why I wrote my new book, Land Your Dream Job Anywhere. For 15 years at MaxList, I've helped people in Portland, Oregon, find meaningful, well-paying, and rewarding jobs that they love. Now, I put all of my job hunting secrets in one book, that can help you no matter where you live. You'll learn how to get clear about your career goals, find hidden jobs that never get posted, and ace your next job interview. For more information and to download the first chapter for free, visit maxlist.org slash anywhere. Now let's turn to this week's guest expert, Jessica Smith. Jessica Smith is a wellness and career consultant for 20-somethings. Her coaching philosophy centers on the idea that everybody has an internal voice of wisdom that can help you live with more flow, confidence, and joy. Jessica is the author of the forthcoming book, Your Twenties, scheduled for publication later this year. She also hosts a weekly podcast, Career Coaching with Jessness. Jessica joins us today from San Jose, California. Jessica, thanks for being on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm really excited. We're we're excited to have you as a guest. Now, our topic this week is something I know you know a lot about. It's how best to prepare for a job interview. And what we're really focusing on, on Jessica, is what do you do when you open up that email and you've been invited and you've accepted an invitation to interview for a job and before you walk into the actual interview? I I know you're a big believer in preparation, um, Mm -hmm. especially researching the employer and the hiring process. Jessica, why is it important to research a company before you walk into an interview? Yeah, it's, it's you know, it's interviewing is such a broad and, and big thing that I think it's, you know, the prep can really help break it down into compartments and make it a little bit more bite-sized, right? So it's important to prep because in a way, I think a lot of people get stuck into the mindset of every interview is the same. I'm going to share the same examples, the same background and then just, you know, hope that that resonates with them. But if you do some of that background, that prep beforehand and look at the website and maybe they have a, a page about who we like to hire, right? Or the culture there. And you can pull out some of the buzzwords that they have on their website and then relate it to relevant work experience that you have can can help make the, um, the interview much more um, easy to tackle. Now, you mentioned looking at the company's website and and beginning to understand its culture. What are some other areas that you, you recommend people research when they're, they're, uh, they want to learn more both about the, the employer and, and the job itself? So a couple of things, you know, what I like to always point out is, you know, a lot of the times, you know, your resume is, is really meant to share your technical and tangible skills, right? And the objective of a resume is to get an interview. And then an interview is really meant to showcase not only what you do, but who you are. And so, you know, the objective is to share the human behind the resume. I'm so big on that because at the end of the day, it's it's not what we do. It's who we are and it's how we do the work. So one of the things that you can keep that human aspect and that human connection in the interview, which sometimes can feel a little bit transactional at times, or, you know, you can research the people that you're going to be meeting with. So get the list of people that you're going to be meeting with, look at their LinkedIn profile, and you can 
start to notice, you know, maybe you went to the same school or maybe you worked at a previous company or they have a recommendation from someone that you know, right? It's, you know, the world's getting smaller and smaller. So outside of the website, the using LinkedIn as a platform to research the people individually is, is really, really helpful. Now, I, I can imagine listeners saying, gosh, I was so excited to get the invitation, but I didn't ask about the interview panel. What uh, how do you recommend people find out who's going to be in the room when you walk into that conversation? Yeah, I think, you know, it's 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 funny you bring that up because it's you just simply ask, you know, you can ask. And I think a lot of the times when someone's going through the interview process, they they think that, well, I'm the interviewee. So I just kind of go along the way and that's that. But it, it really should be a two way thing. You know, you're interviewing them just as much as they're interviewing you to make sure that you're a good fit. So you can you can ask the recruiter if that's who's coordinating. Uh, majority of the times, they should be sending a list of people. But if they don't, you know, just simply ask or give a call to their main line and you can ask for the recruiting or HR department and they can help you out that way. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you're making that point, Jessica, because it's uh, about that it's a two-way street. It's you don't have to just wait to be told to do things. Uh, And I found that candidates who do reach out to an employer and and ask that question, that hiring managers will tell me they appreciate that because they they can tell that the person is preparing and and it's going to be a a better conversation as a result. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, we're talking about preparation and and you mentioned, you know, knowing who's in the room, knowing something about them, looking for that that human connection, a shared background or interests or schools. What about tough questions, though? Uh, how how important it is is it, Jessica, to prepare for tough questions, and and how do you go about doing that? Yeah, that's a big question. There, <laughs> it's a question about questions, which is funny. But you know, my my biggest piece of advice for this is really, you know, people always come to me and say, well, "How do I figure out what work experience I'm going to sh- share, and how do I put that all together?" So. What you can do is you can look through your background and pick out an, a project or a process, something that has a start to an end, um, something that has a clear objective or goal, right? So then you can, from that example, you can build out, and I know this is going to sound super cliche and everyone reads you know, this online, but the STAR method, but my version of the STAR method is a little bit more in depth. So... The STAR method for those who are um, new to that um, option is situation. So you're explaining your experience from, you know, first you start with the situation and then the task at hand and then the action that was taken and then the result of that task that was uh, moved forward. But then what you can do is, is really make sure that you're speaking from an I perspective. A lot of the times I find people Say we as a team, us, them, you know, we accomplish this. So make sure that you're speaking in I. And that's that's one of the main tips you can use for preparing for tough questions. Because if you explain it from that I perspective right off the bat, the interviewer is going to know that you are directly hands-on involved and they know that you had an active role. Now, the other little piece of this that I like to put a spin on it is, Again, that human connection, right? Not just, hey, here's what I do and here's the tasks that I can carry out, but the human and the how you do the work, you can add in to the STAR method how you went about completing each task or maybe why you chose one method of planning over another um, or how you approach that problem or maybe the thought process behind something. And um, and that can really beef up that, that typical STAR method of answering questions and it can really create a well-rounded example of your previous work experience. And, and typically the hard questions, are they're, they're just looking for a lot of detail. So if you do that detail work up front and really prep for those, those kinds of questions won't be as tough anymore. What's your best advice, Jessica, about just choosing the, the, the examples that, that you might share at an interview? Because particularly if you're mid-career, you walk into that room and you, you might have dozens of examples of things you've accomplished that and uh, that you could bring up. What? How do you choose the one that is going to be most effective? Yeah, that's a really good question. So one of the things that I, you know, you want to stay relevant, of course, and how do you make sure you're relevant and sharing the right stuff from your background? 
you really need to look over the job description and it's a lot of the times job descriptions are quite vague, um, but you have to really look at, okay, where are they talking about in this job description performance measurements or key initiatives that this person's going to be helping drive, right, when they get into the role, or maybe they're working on a specific project and, and look for those tangible things um, in between some of the job description bullet points that may say, you know, looking for a collaborative person, you know, you want something to, to grab onto and, and look back from your work experience and see if you have any that match with those examples that they have in the job description because they're there. But I think a lot of the times people don't once they get the interview, they, they kind of never look back at that job description. So use that as a guide, at least to to pull out relevant examples from your past work experience. So uh, I, I love that because I, I think you're right. Many people get so excited about the opportunity, they don't go back and revisit the job description and, and think about not only the, the role and the responsibilities, but the employer's needs. Uh, how have you seen in the candidates you've worked with, Jessica, people figure out what is keeping an employer awake at night or what their biggest problems or challenges are? Because it's, it's, it goes back to your first point about the importance of research and, and preparation. It's almost kind of a, a detective game, isn't it? Figuring out. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, how, for how sure. You, yeah, how do you see people do that well when they walk into a room? How do they either know in advance what matters to the hiring manager or how do they draw that out in a conversation? Yeah, for sure. So typically, at least most processes have an initial phone screen And the phone screen isn't as in-depth. Usually you're talking to either a recruiter or maybe you talk to the recruiter and then have a chat with the hiring manager and then you go on site. But they'll always be asking you throughout every, every step of the way, you know, what questions do you have for me? And that's really an opportunity for people to ask those tough questions back to the employer and, and ask them, you know, what, why is this a new position? Is this a replacement? You know, are there, Um, key initiatives that this department is working on right now that I would be contributing to because it not only can help you get out some of those pain points and and some of those key goals of the department and company that you can speak to if you have experience helping with some of those things that they're working on but you can also find out sort of the the more meaty info right that's not typically in the job description Um, because some of those you know what keeps you up at night those are fun on questions to ask. I mean, let's be real. Everyone likes talking about themselves. So if you ask, whether you ask the recruiter that works internally at the company or that or that hiring manager, if someone is showing a vested interest in the problems that he's facing without him even being in the seat officially, he's probably going to think, okay, well, this person is definitely serious about the position, putting themselves in the role and picturing themselves coming in and, and helping and making an impact right away. So it's, you know, don't be afraid to to ask those those questions throughout the way and, and use that opportunity to, when they ask you, what questions do you have for me to showcase your your seriousness about the role and, and interest in, in something a little bit more than just, hey, what's your vacation policy? <laughs> you know, it, you'd be shocked at the questions that are asked, but um, but use those opportunities for your for your own benefit and keep keep just a notepad of all of the lists of information you found out, right? Like a detective would, you know, just all of the pieces of info so that you can use that along with the website and job description before the main on-site interview. And, and really you'll have a, a solid piece of, of info to kind of go off and, and jump forward and prepare for that interview. Okay. And what about rehearsals, uh, Jessica? What kind of you know, we're talking today about preparation and you've talked about research and having your own questions ready. Do What kind of uh, re- rehearsing or role play do you recommend uh, to the people you work with uh, that they do before they walk into that interview room? One of the things that I I like to recommend, and it's it's similar to, it's staying on kind of the same vein as staying relevant, but when you pick out what work experience you want to highlight, You'll want to role play answering or explaining that work experience to two different people, for instance. So you want to be relevant to that individual interviewer that's asking you the question. So, for instance, an, a CFO, if they're asking you, you know, tell me about your work experience, they're going to be caring about 
a lot, <laughs> something very different than maybe a recruiting manager or an HR, you know, director, because, you know, because their roles are very different. So you have to kind of be flexible in the work examples that you're sharing, role play, answering that same example to two different people within the company. And um, I found that if you if you stay relevant and you alter and you have that flexibility in being able to explain your work experience in in a way that would really resonate with that interviewer, I, I find that um, even if it's the same exact example, um, it goes a long way because you're speaking their language. <laughs> so they'll identify that as um, as a positive, right? As a wow, this person can really come in and impact my department. Great. Well, I, it's been a great conversation, Jessica. Now, tell us what's coming up next for you. Oh, my gosh. Well, um, well, I have, obviously, my podcast. You announced that. Um, that's a weekly thing that I'm having a really fun time with. We're already up to 50-plus episodes, which is just so fun. Um, my book, you know, there's there's a couple different things on my website that are, are free for people. I've created... Um, free uh, career success guides that people can download and it helps people with um, following up after interviews, um, interview prep. There's a, there's an outline there and there's a couple other email templates for, for really how to stand out and create your personal brand in the market. Um, and if you can sign up for those on, on my website and there's also a, a book bonus um, series where it's exclusive content that's going to be, um, it's already being released right now, but it goes along with my book and some additional resources for people, um, which from each of the chapters in my book. So those are two, two things that I'm, um, that are live and I'm excited about sharing with your audience if they're interested, but, um, but thank you so much for having me. I had a blast. Great. It's been a pleasure having you. And we'll be sure to include links to those resources in the show notes. And I know people can also learn more about you and your work by visiting your website. That URL is JessnessRequired.com. Uh, Jessica, thanks for being on the show. Okay. Thanks so much. Have a good one. Well, we're back in the Maxless studio with Jessica and Ben. I enjoyed that conversation with uh, Jessica Smith. Uh, tell me, Jessica Black, what <laughs> what were your thoughts? <laughs> well, I, um, in general, loved her, all of her points, but especially um, I liked her point about the asking in the, in the interview itself. Um, this was towards the end of the interview about the, do you have any questions for me? Um, we talk about that a lot here, but, um, having that as a, as a way to be able to show your interest and dig a little deeper. Um, she sort of mentioned it as a, instead of just asking about the vacation pay, but I'll actually learn about the company culture. And I think it was related to phone interviews before the actual in-person interview. But, um, I really liked that point. And I think that's a really good tip that not everybody, uses um, or thinks about. And I, so I think that that is a really good, in addition to the research that you do uh, of the website and the, the people that work there beforehand, that's another good way to ask specific questions that you may want to know. Yeah, I agree. And it also um, it supports another point that Jessica Smith made, which was that it's a conversation. Mm -hmm. it, you, you, you have an opportunity to ask your own questions and, you're also shopping. It's not, uh, uh, you're trying to figure out if this is a good fit or not. Absolutely. And that um, actually touches on another point that I liked about her focus on customization of your resume and um, and not going in there having sort of a memorized speech of what you're going to say because you have to have a more personalized conversation and it has to sort of, you have to be able to speak to anyone in the organization and have that resonate. And if you're so focused on specific verbiage or specific wording, it, you may get lost in that and it won't land for everybody. Agreed. Ben, what are your thoughts? I want to go back to something she said at the beginning of the interview, which was reading through an organization's website and their marketing materials to get a sense of their language. Because I think this is a really underappreciated piece of research you can do. And I think it's especially true for, for folks who are trying to make a transition into a different sector 
the the idea on the top of my mind right now is like people who are in the for profit sector trying to go into the non profit sector, which we hear a lot about. Frankly, they're just like two complete different lexicons those industries use, and reading about how an organization talks about itself gives you a real strong sense of the kind of language they use. And the more you can mimic that language and bring that into your presentation in the interview, the better fit you're going to look like. Um, you know, I've talked in the past about how, you know, if you're a salesman and you go in for a job as a fundraiser at a nonprofit and you're talking about sales and, you know, leads and things like that, it just doesn't resonate with the nonprofit folks. You need to know their language so that they can see very clearly that you can fit into this organization. Uh, I like that uh, because it, it it goes back to another one of her points, which is you need to know the people in the room and you need to know who they are and a little bit about what makes them tick. You're not doing you know, extensive background checks here, but uh, there's really, there's no excuse not only to know who you're meeting with, but to know something about them. It's just so easy to, to research. And, and your advantage is if you do that, you'll not only have a more productive conversation, uh, and you'll stand out, uh, but you'll probably be head and shoulders above so many other candidates because I still don't think a lot of people do the kind of research that she's recommending here. Yeah, I agree. I think you're right. Great. Well, thank you both. And, and thank you, Jessica Smith, for joining us this week. And you, our listeners, for downloading today's episode of Find Your Dream Job. If you like what you hear, please sign up for our free weekly newsletter. In every issue, we give you the key points of that week's show. We also include links to all the resources mentioned, and you get a transcript of the full episode. If you subscribe to the newsletter now, we'll send you our job seeker checklist in one easy-to-use file. We show you all the steps you need to take to find a great job. Get your free newsletter and checklist today. Go to maxlist.org slash podcast. And join us next Wednesday when our special guest will be Allison Cardi. She'll explain how to manage job search stress. Until next time, thanks for letting us help you find your dream job.